Hi. Oh, you know what I was going to do? I wonder if it'll change it, if you can still see me sideways. Okay, your device. You can't turn your phone while live. Okay, so I got to go back. I'm sorry. This will have to do. Hello. Um, it's Monday. It's Monday. April 17th. And this week I started Lisa Harper's Luke Bible study. And so today I thought I'm going to take a little break in the faith files. And I thought maybe I would tell you what I learned on day one. And here's what I learned on day one. <laughs> so we started Luke. And it was Luke 1. Oh, I haven't even, I haven't done a song. I haven't done anything. I don't have a song I can think of that I could sing to you. But what I also didn't do, look, there's just enough left. That's good. All right. You know what song's in my head, actually? And it's been in my head for like a week now. Is that, oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. It's in my head. It's a good song to have in your head, though. <laughs> anyway, listen. Luke 1, 1 through 25, okay? It starts... It, it's about the birth uh, of John the Baptist. And Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth, um, Zechariah and Elizabeth, they were infertile. Okay? They couldn't have kids. And God looked at them as godly. They were righteous people. And so they would prayed for things. And, and especially back then, it was really like... It was really looked down upon, really shameful if you couldn't have children. If you could have kids, you know, you were celebrated and all that stuff. Listen, I'm not trying to get like emotional or anything about it because I have locked that stuff down nice and tight. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm sorry. That's probably super unhealthy, <laughs> but I have. However, it's not necessarily different today, per se, because I can't have kids. I had cancer here. I had radiation, which I don't know if that affected anything there, but I had endometriosis when I was, like, in junior high from the beginning. I had issues. I had tumors, grapefruit size, watermelon-sized cysts. My organs were stuck together with scar tissue and affixed to the inside of my abdomen wall. They sliced me open like a train track. Here's the thing. It has always been like a stick in the side. You know, you go to church on Mother's Day and they always, you know, celebrate the moms and stuff and moms and grandmas and all the stuff. But if you are not a mom, you are never celebrated. You're not celebrated as a, like, um, mother figure. You're not celebrated as a mother, uh, like an auntie. You know, if you don't have kids, the women who've been pregnant, who've gotten to, you know, birth their children, you just don't understand unless you've actually been pregnant. Well, kick rocks. <laughs> You just don't understand unless you've had a half a watermelon-sized cyst in your abdomen, two grapefruit-sized tumors, and your organs stuck together with scar tissue and affixed to the inside of your abdomen while decades of pain, three weeks a month for 20-plus years of pain. You don't understand either, so I'm sure your birth for nine hours was terrible. Tell me about it. I'm so sorry for you. <laughs> I'm not bitter or anything. Uh, anyway, I have furry children, and so you, you're not quite a mom. You're not a woman completely because you haven't experienced pregnancy and you don't have kids. So I understand Elizabeth 100%, okay? <laughs> I, I understand her 100%. Let's, let's move on. I'm not ready for all that. But here's the part that, like, really just kind of like, mm, 
was harsh. This is harsh. So Zechariah goes into the temple and like they take turns or whatever going in to do something. It's his turn. He goes in and an angel appears. Now, if an angel appeared right next to me, okay, if I'm looking at him, I would be terrified. And he was afraid, understandably. And he's like, don't be afraid because God, Philip wants to join me on video. I don't know who you are, dude. I'm talking about Jesus. Go away. <laughs> and I'm married. Anyway, <laughs> wants to join me on video. You want to join me talking about infertility and Jesus? Come on board. Anyway, um, so he's terrified. And he says, don't be afraid. Okay. And the angel says to him, God has heard your prayer. You and Elizabeth, you're righteous people. And God has heard your prayer. And Elizabeth is going to get pregnant. And you're going to call him John. And he's going to be a joy. And people are going to love him. And he's going to be important to God. It's like in, he, you know, John the Baptist. He sets up the, he's, anyway. So he tells him all this stuff, right? Oh. And then here's the part, let me mute this. And then here's the part that I think is harsh. So he's telling him these things. And then he says to the angel, how shall I know this? You know, cause like I'm an old man and my wife is well advanced in years. Now here's the thing. I a hundred percent would say something like that. Now I'm, but I'm like, if an angel were looking at my face telling me that God said something, would I doubt him? I mean, I mean, I just think I might be like, I might have my own questions. I mean, I really might. <laughs> and so he says that and I'm like, yeah, no, I understand. And maybe I think that because I've never seen an angel with these two eyeballs. I don't actually know. But anyway, the angel says to him, and this is... <laughs> This is the part. The angel says to him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God and was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings. But behold, you will be mute and not able to speak until the day these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their own time. I feel like that is harsh. I mean... First of all, that's pretty awesome. He's like, how will I know this? I'm an old man. And he's like, I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. There's a little bit of like, mm, to Gabriel's, what he says to him, which he's Gabriel. He's like, you know, he's Gabriel. So of course he's like, uh, I am fierce. I'm not just an angel coming to tell you some willy nilly thing. I'm like a higher angel and I, I'm an archangel. I stand in the presence of God. So then he tells him he's going to be mute. Why is that? He's going to, he tells him he's going to be mute. Okay. Let me get out of that. And he tells him, there we go. He tells him he's going to be mute. And she goes away for five months. Okay. And then I assume, and it's to, it's not to like hide that she's pregnant, I don't think, but just to meditate and be with the Lord. And, you know, I don't know. So he can't speak for that whole time. I assume he can speak after she, everybody knows she's pregnant she's pregnant because he wasn't able to tell everybody. I don't know. Five months, nine months, something. He's mute. I feel like that's harsh. And when I was reading the commentary, this is what it says. It's not that he doesn't want to believe. He does. It is simply that he feels it must be too good to be true. And he has probably protected in himself from disappointment by not setting his expectations too high. We rob ourselves of many a miracle by the same attitude. Zechariah looked at the circumstances first and what God can do last. And we're tempted to think this is logical, but if God is real, 
There's nothing logical about putting circumstances before God. You know, and so he says, I'm Gabriel who stands in the presence of God. And this is where he says, there's a big contrast between I'm an old man and I am Gabriel, you know, which held more weight. So Gabriel gives him good news. Gabriel preaches the gospel to him. Basically, he gives him he's going to have a son. He gives him glad tidings. He tells him that his son's going to have a significant role in God's plans of redemption. Like it's all good. And so the last thing it says is it's this, it's a better idea of what it really means to preach the gospel. It is to bring good news to people who need it. So he tells him that whole thing. He says, well, how am I going to know? And then he's like, uh, I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And because you didn't believe me, you're going to be mute. And he's mute for like five months. He paid a price. This is what it says in the commentary. Because like I said, I feel like that's harsh. But it says, Zechariah paid a price for his unbelief. His unbelief did not make God take his promise back. It just kept Zechariah from enjoying it. When we do not believe God's promise for our lives, we don't necessarily destroy the promise, but we do destroy our ability to enjoy the promise. What made this such a severe punishment was that Zechariah had such great news to tell. Strangely, many Christians would not consider this a punishment. They don't mind keeping quiet about the good news of Jesus. I was like, man... And I thought, you know what? I still think it's harsh. I think, and I don't know. Did God tell, this is the questions I have. Did God tell Gabriel, listen, you're going to go give him good, glad tidings. He's going to doubt you. And when he doubts you, this is his punishment. Or did he send Gabriel and then Gabriel and God had a little e e ESP or whatever. And when he doubted, God told Gabriel, this is his punishment. Or did he come tell him the stuff? Zechariah doubted him and Gabriel issued his own punishment. <laughs> These are questions that I have. I feel like it's harsh. But at the same time, like I said, if I had a, if I had, if Gabriel, uh, Gabriel's not a normal angel. I feel like he's, and if that angel was standing right here in my room to tell me something, I've never seen anything like that. I don't think I would doubt it. Because I've never seen anything like that. But I don't want to say I'm so much better than Zechariah. I'm glad that this happened in the sense that it's like God didn't rip his promise from him. He didn't, he didn't take it back. There was just a short period of time. And he still got to enjoy the promise. He still had his son. But there was just a small period of time that he didn't get to enjoy the promise. There was a small period of time that he had a price to pay for not believing the promise of God. It didn't change God's promise and God didn't rip the promise away from him. But our unbelief in the things that God has told us don't change the promise God's given us. They change our experience of the promise. You understand? Anyway, I still think it was a little harsh and I'm going to have questions about it when I go to see Gabriel in heaven. <laughs> I'm going to ask some questions. I mean, I'm probably going to have a lot of questions. But you know what? When I go to be with the Lord, maybe I'll just know. You know, when I die, maybe I'll just have the answers. Maybe I'll just have the answers. I won't have to ask questions. I'll just know things. I don't know. If I have to ask questions, I'll ask questions. There's nothing sinful about asking questions. <laughs> So when I am in my perfect body, if I have to find out and I don't know the answer, I'm going to ask the Lord about it. Anyways, I love you guys like a crazy person. So that was day one of my boop of my Lisa Harper gut level compassion. And she asked some questions in here and I that I wrote and I, I think, you know, I think I got to chew more on some of them because, you know, it's like some of the stuff there's a question and I feel like my answer is very simple. You know what I mean? Like I wrote my answer. I don't know. Maybe it's supposed to be simple. Maybe you just answer how you feel. You don't have to be so in depth about it. But anyway, we'll see. So I'm excited, but that's day one. So, uh, I hope you guys have a wonderful week. I hope you're being good to one another. Don't forget you're one of the one another's. Don't forget to be good to yourself. I love you, and I mean it, peanut. 